What's up, friends? Today, to kick off another three-part Hoods episode, we're headed to the wonderful Seoul neighborhood of Jamshu, where we'll be going in hard on a renowned and humongous pork backbone stew, checking out some local sites, and looking back at a pivotal event that many people today think of as a true turning point for modern Korea, the epic 1988 Seoul Olympics. Get ready for a mountain of unctuousness, immediately followed by some vigorous physical activity. It's a recipe for success. If you've caught enough of our other episodes, you've likely seen us making foodie stops in Jamshil before. Located just below the Han River and the Sompa district, this area is known to have a ton of flavor and plenty of incredible dining spots, but it's also a place that represents the city of Seoul like no other. It's home to some absolutely iconic landmarks, as well as some dynamic big-time Korean corporations, and it has a deep connection to the story of South Korea's late 20th century rise to international prominence. We'll be diving into all that and more over the next few episodes, but as usual, our first priority is flooring the gas pedal to Tasty Town. And to do just that, we're hitting up a restaurant here that's been on our must-visit list for a long while. Songpanaruyeok 근처에 위치하고 2000년대 초반부터 운영되고 있는 이곳은 청년 감자탕 본점으로 몇 년간 많은 관심을 받아온 곳입니다. 현재 30개의 지점이 있고 특히 순대국과 가게 이름에도 나와 있듯이 감자탕이 인기가 많은데요. 저희는 감자탕 먹으러 왔습니다. For those that aren't familiar, Gamjatang is a classic traditional stew made with pork spine bones, potato, a rich spicy broth, and an assortment of other ingredients. Chongyan's version, which is notoriously massive in size, includes sesame leaf, enoki mushroom, bugoji, or dried outer cabbage leaves, and optional ground wild sesame seed for adding as much nuttiness as you like. This is delicious. It's a mix of the and the sour taste, but the flavor of the sour taste and the sour taste are still very delicious. The sour taste is very delicious. The sour taste is very delicious. The sour taste is very delicious. 콜라겐 듬뿍과 맛있는 힘줄 등도 들어가 있어서 돼지 등뼈가 이 음식의 주인공임을 다시 한번 깨닫게 해주는데요. 아참, 또 여기 우거지가 너무 좋다는 말씀을 안 드릴 수가 없네요. 우거지가 정말 많이 들어있고 깊은 야채의 단맛을 끌어내 주는데 아주 딱입니다. 정말 거대한 강적과 맞닥뜨렸는데 최선을 다해서 먹어보지만 진한 맛이 계속 밀고 들어오고 국물은 시간이 갈수록 더더 진해지고 깊어지네요. 다행스럽게도 아주 맛있는 깍두기가 이 진한 맛을 가볍게 하는 데 도움을 주는 것 외에도 이 식사를 계속하는 데 도움이 될 만한 것이 또 오고 있습니다. 진짜 먹을 만큼 먹었다 싶었을 때 건더기를 걷어내고 밥, 김가루, 깻잎, 참깨, 생선알과 국물 한 국자를 끼얹어줍니다. 강불에서 2, 3분 볶아주고 바닥에 눌러붙는 면적을 최대화하기 위해 퍼뜨려주고 갈린 치즈를 듬뿍듬뿍 얹어줍니다. 치즈가 완전히 표면을 감싸고 아름답게 녹아내리면 준비가 다 되었습니다. 오 마이 갓, 엄청나네요. 바닥 쪽은 바삭하게 구워지고 위쪽은 부드럽고 녹아내리면서 끈적하고 맛으로 아주 가득 차 있습니다. 국물이 은근하게 구수한 맛을 주고 김과 깻잎이 살짝 짠 맛과 허브 향으로 뚫고 나오고 생선 알갱이는 맛있는 감칠맛을 더해줍니다. 이제 돼지 지방에서 나온 칼로리가 아주 폭발할 지경인데요. 뭐 반격하는 게 의미가 있을까 싶습니다. 그냥 같이 빠져드는 거죠, 뭐. 이번 식사는 완벽한 A+였지만 특히나 저에게 엔딩은 정말 말로 표현하기 힘들 정도입니다. 잠깐 생각할 시간을 가지고 낮잠 좀잔 후에 또 탐험을 떠나봐야겠어요. There's a lot that's unique about this neighborhood, but without a doubt, one thing that's synonymous with Jamsho is sports. For one, it's home to the largest baseball stadium in South Korea, built in 1982. This site is used to host games for both the Doosan Bears and LG Twins, the two top-tier league Korean teams based in Seoul, and accordingly, it's a constant attraction for a lot of folks in town every April through September. It's also just one piece of a bigger chunk of real estate known as the Seoul Sports Complex, which contains a number of arenas and facilities on the west side of Jamsho. Nearby, just a stone's throw from the baseball big house, is one highlight of the complex that's more on the inspirational side. 
a small memorial to the legendary long distance runner and national hero, Son Ki Jong. If you've never heard his story, Son was the first ethnic Korean to ever receive an Olympic medal when he set a world record and won gold in the marathon at the Berlin 1936 Summer Olympics. Since Korea had at that point been under colonial rule for over 25 years, he was forced to compete on behalf of Japan, a nation that he never thought of as his own and whose anthem he notoriously refused to acknowledge at his award ceremony. His victory was not only a symbol of determination for the Korean independence movement at that time, but for decades onward, it would continue to be a huge source of domestic pride. Just beyond the memorial lies one more key highlight, Olympic Stadium, currently the largest stadium of any kind in the country. It was first used for the 1986 Asian Games, which were a major deal in South Korea, and over the years, it's hosted everything from big soccer matches to mega star concerts from the likes of the Backstreet Boys, Elton John, and my personal badass faves, the Three Tenors. But most notably, it was a prime venue for the Seoul 1988 Summer Olympics, one of the monumental moments of this nation's recent history. And to properly tell that tale, for which Jamsha was ground zero, we're moving a couple miles east to an absolute gem of a spot. Undoubtedly cracking the list of the most interesting places to seek out in this area and covering nearly one and a half million square meters of ground, Olympic Park is massive. It contains a long list of visit-worthy features, ranging from performance spaces and museums to the remnants of a roughly 1,700-year-old Baekje Kingdom fortress, and it houses several more arenas and facilities that were used for competition during the 1988 games. But to me, it's also the best location in the city to give context to those Olympic games and to the pivotal decade they occurred in. Looking back, it's hard to overstate just how big of a deal the summer of 88 was. It was the first Olympics in years to feature the world's biggest rival nations together on one stage due to politically motivated boycotts in 1980 and 84, and it would end up being the last Olympics held during the Cold War era, i.e. the last time that the Soviet Union and East Germany would be around to participate. Though fun fact, those two nations would go out with a bang, with the Big Papa Soviet Union winning a monstrous 55 gold medals and East Germany winning 36 to place second. South Korea, on the other hand, also raised some eyebrows by earning a surprise fourth place finish and claiming 12 gold medals in archery, judo, boxing, table tennis, handball, and wrestling. By all accounts, it was an unexpectedly gutsy performance for such a small and young host nation. But aside from the sport of it all, the Summer Games meant so much more to this country. And for many, that's where the real juice of this story is at. To sum it up, 1988 represented an epic climax of sorts after a decade of major political upheaval. The authoritarian-leaning president Park Chung-hee had been assassinated in 1979, his successor Chun de hwan had seized power via a military coup and never once won anything resembling a real election, and constant political suppression coupled with martial law became the norm for South Korea in the 80s. We'll have more time to discuss Chun's cruelty in future episodes, particularly his overseeing of the brutal and deadly military response to the Gwangju uprising, but one sin that's quite relevant to this thread was his administration's way of supposedly cleaning up the streets during the years of Olympic preparation. In the name of safety, and in an attempt to create a very particular public image to the outside world, Chun routinely had his authorities round up and detain thousands of quote-unquote vagrants, victimized souls that were often guilty of nothing more than being homeless, disabled, politically uncooperative, or drunk in public, and that in some cases were mere children. It was commonplace for them to be held without trial, and just as commonplace to be sent to nightmarish slave labor centers, like the infamous Brothers Home in the city of Pusan. Places where torture, sexual abuse, and even murder would occur regularly, completely unbeknownst to the general public. These atrocities have been slowly getting more exposure in recent years, but not nearly enough has been done to hold the worst perpetrators to account, and demands for justice are still being put forward today. There was a bright spot in the run-up to 1988, however. In the summer of 87, enormous protests erupted, 
with participation from all segments of society. They were peaceful, they were powerful, and they demanded a fresh start and a move toward real democracy. Chon Du Huan would be forced to step down, and even though corruption and government wrongdoing wouldn't magically disappear overnight, a humongous societal shift had occurred. By the time the Olympics rolled around, the nation had much more to celebrate than winning a couple of high-stakes ping-pong matches, even though that would feel pretty damn good too. Citizens absolutely packed the streets and stadiums, or were otherwise glued to their television sets, and thousands and thousands of foreigners joined the party, a fitting precursor to the increasingly gigantic splashes that South Korea would make in the coming decades, on a global level. The emotion of it all was perhaps at its peak when the then 76-year-old Song Ki-jong, the marathon runner we mentioned earlier, was the one carrying the official torch into Olympic Stadium for the opening ceremony. But back to the park. If you somehow were to arrive here unaware of any history, or of the connection to such an important event, you would still find something extremely special. It's an exquisitely maintained public space, like so many other sites in Seoul, and it's designed so that one can easily unwind, find quiet, get lost in the greenery and open spaces, and maybe even stumble into some inspiration. And as to all of the above, that's exactly what we've done with our time here. For all the running around and hunting for heavenly grub that we do, sometimes it's nice to just turn the volume way down and enjoy some peace, and then go eat again. Stay tuned for part two of our look at Jamsho, which will most definitely include more eats and treats. And in the meantime, keep being lovely, folks. <laughs>